So Stuart Goodyear, I'm happy to be able to talk to you about a multitude of things that you have going on in your career, because as ever, there are always a multitude of things. Um, but before we get into some of those things, I want to ask you about something you told CBC's Manitoba scene 11 years ago. You said, when it comes to enthusiasm for performing for the audience, the secret is always to remember why one became a musician in the first place and keeping that joy and that passion alive. The world has been through so much since you said that, and you've also made some significant changes in your career during that time. Do you still feel that way? And what are the challenges of keeping that passion alive? Um, I don't think there are challenges. It's always a lot of work and it's always bringing your best game to every concert. And, you know, because the audience deserves that, um, I believe. And it's always a new encounter. It's always the postcard for that time, that event. And um, I take every single concert very seriously because um, I love sharing myself with the audience. And, you know, the audience shares themselves with me with the vibe that they give. And from there, there's a collaboration that occurs. And um, yes, that passion never dies. So what is it you think the audience learns about you through a given performance? That is a very good question. I hope that um, through our collaboration, we get to learn from each other. I know for me, I learn a lot about the audience. And I feel like every single time I perform, it's always a learning experience because I always they always bring me something new and... Um, it's always organic. And I'm hoping that uh, what the audience gets from me is just, uh, you know, my love for the whole experience. You do, you do, you do maintain your privacy, which I think is amazing that somebody can do that in 2022, what with social media and everything like that. So is beyond your passion for the music, is there other things that you think about who you are as a person, who you are as an artist that comes through in the in the music that you perform and the music you write. I need to be more active on social media. I'm a you know I'm a dinosaur, and um, I need to I need to um, get used to the fact that there are people that are curious about um, you know the other aspects of my life, and um, I do need to share myself more. And it's it's not like I'm deliberately trying to be private, but um, yeah, I, I just need to get around to it. You know, I see, you know, you know the people that I follow. They talk about restaurants that they've been to, um, movies that um, they have seen, and I'm very much passionate about you know food. I love cooking, and um, I think um, besides um, being a musician, I'm very much interested in cinema. So um, I'm thinking about perhaps um, you know just opening up my website and doing some blogging and maybe vlogging. And, um, you know, it was so interesting, you know, David Dobrik was somehow um, <laughs> a character that appeared on my radar when it came to YouTube. And, you know, and just the fact that with his um, group of friends, they get into all kinds of uh, various adventures, but they're always, there's always this carefree um, collaboration that goes on between the viewer and what they're doing. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? You know the vibe that they get, uh, they uh, that they um, that they give off is just one that is filled of uh, filled with fun and always living for the next moment, and and that is something that I'm also uh, that I'm also a strong believer in as well, just living for every moment and just um, you know having that gratitude for every moment and sharing that with um, people. Well, you have a lot of big moments coming up, um, and I want to talk about two of them. One is um, the Albany Symphony is going to be giving the world premiere of your piano concerto. How did you approach this composition and what did you want to express with it? Well, this was a piece that um, was um, a very vulnerable project because this was um, the first time that I was actually writing a vehicle for myself. And, you know, when it came to other works for piano and orchestra, I was always looking at it from, you know, from a composer's hat. And, um, you know, even even with Kalalu, when I wrote Kalalu, it was very much um, thinking about um, paying homage to my Trinidadian background. But this is a very much, um, um, you know, just a piece that is, you know, that is strictly a piano concerto. And, um, you know, uh, taking the plunge with that genre and um, remembering, but also erasing, you know, you know, just the whole, you know, the whole history so that I could just approach this piano concerto um um, with fresh eyes uh, was something that um, was a very exciting project. 
Well, and also, you know, with a fresh perspective on what on what that that particular form of composition can offer, I would assume. Yeah. Um, so last year, Anthony Tomasini of the New York Times um, did an interview with you and you were talking to your pro- about your approach as plain as going through everything, finding my own truth, as well as respect the tradition, the gestures, the music that inspired the composers. And it was that last bit that really st- stood out to me as you're embarking on writing, you know, as you have written a piano concerto. So I'm wondering, what is the music that inspired you as a composer for this concerto? And how does that get layered into not just what you wrote, but how you'll play it? Um, with how I'll play it, it's it's really it's, it's really going to be interesting in terms of, um, you know, what um, uh, Maestro um, David Allen Miller and I, um, how you know, how we work together. But uh, my inspiration was, um, you know, just going to a friend's house and, um, you know, believe it or not, my inspiration was, um, eighties to, um, uh, 2022's pop music and, uh, almost being like a pianist at karaoke where, um, I got to find out, you know, just a lot about, um, every genre from country music to rap and how every single, um, world has their own set of rules when it comes to harmony and how, one chord goes on to the next. And um, it was something that um, I was not conscious of until, you know, that period. And then somehow that was, you know, how the concerto came to be and the inspiration came from there. That was the germ. Then I'm I'm intuiting, I hope correctly, that through that, if, if, if popular music is one inspiration for this, that you are not shying away from melody. Never. <laughs> Well, melody, you know, is also, you know, um, there are no rules when it comes to melody. And, you know, every composer approaches melody very, very differently. Even, you know, even composers that one wouldn't, uh, one wouldn't think of as tuneful, there's always a melody and there's always a line. So um, I think that's what kept, uh, you know, kept my options open. And um, even, even if it was um, inspired by popular music, I didn't feel myself boxed in to one set of influ- influence when it came, when it came to um, the melodies I created. Well, it's not, it's clearly not going to be variations on themes by insert name of artist here. Right. Yeah. But it is, yes, I was always a fan of melody. Um, when I, I was a chorister, uh, at, um, I went to a choir school in Toronto and we would be singing motets, um, mass settings, and my family loves to sing, so there was always um, that um, background of singing and you know singing along to um, various pieces. So um, you know, I think that always that um, that that always stuck with me, and that always became a part of me. And um, the way that I would write, there was a lot of lyricism in there. It's interesting because I was had a conversation with a retired, not then, but now retired and perhaps deceased bass player from the LA Philharmonic. And he told me how much he he admired Esapekka Salonen, but he did go up to him and say, you know, there's nothing wrong with melody in in you know <laughs> late 20th, early 21st century music, um, because there are a lot of composers who as much create atmosphere and soundscapes as they do, yeah. you know, melodic structure. So that's that's why I ask about the melody. And Esapekka Salonen is um, a composer who I r- very much admire, and um, you know his gift of lyricism, and you know as well as I- exactly what you said, his um, his sense of color and atmosphere in the world that he creates, that sound world, is um, you know it's every every piece I I I, I admire very greatly. Yeah, and if you want to talk about a challenge, try his piano concerto. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's that's difficult. Um, now you're coming out to Los Angeles to perform at the Wallace, a recital that is that is you know mostly springs from your album Phoenix. Um, I assume that the title is referencing the mythological bird that symbolizes immortality, resurrection, and life after death. That's right. So, how did you want this collection of music and your performance of it? to sort of make a statement about how, we, how we've struggled along in the last few years, whether it's through the pandemic, through social justice, through racial inequities, through it's a tumultuous time. And I'm wondering, you know, how this music for you maybe comments on that and if you feel like we're moving in the right direction. Um, 
I hope we're moving in the right direction. I think, you know, with music, as long as there's that feeling of communication, we are moving in the right direction. You're absolutely right. Every, every piece very much is a mirror of what has happened in the past few years and the sentiment behind it, uh, whether or not it's Anthony Davis's incredible middle passage, uh, uh, my, my own Phoenix, which um, pays homage to my Trinidadian background, um, you know, as well as um, the pianism of Liszt and Beethoven, uh, Jennifer Higdon's um, Glass Gardens um, poem, which imagines an urban setting but also a natural setting within that um, time frame, um, Debussy, and also Beethoven's Hamaclavier, which is almost the embodiment of struggle, where um, everything is very dramatic. There's there's absolutely no caution, and it's one of the most dangerous pieces ever written. And um, I think, especially um, during these uh, past few years, there was always that feeling of danger and unrest, unfortunately, and, you know, just, you know, things run amok. People are, you know, uh, there are, there were people who I guess felt entirely hopeless and, you know, they chose one way out, which I do not agree with. And um, it's, it's been a very trying time and a very testing time for a lot of people. And it's, and being in tune again with, you know, that childlike fascination of what is positive and, um, you know, and the love people give and, you know, just getting away from the jaded negative aspects and, you know, just coming down to basics where one is just communicating with one another. I think that's one way of, um, um, I'm hoping that that, pro uh, that program that I perform in LA touches on that because I believe that every piece has that. You know, you, you touched on something I think is really important to me personally, which is the idea of people communicating with each other. How much do you think technology gets in the way of, of real communication? Um, well, and anything could get in the way. Any Anything or any um, aspect, whether or not, you know, whether or not it's the pandemic, many people, um, you, you know, um, sometimes the pandemic caused a lot of um, struggle, heartache, and if technology is not used right, it could be the same thing. You know, if one is too bombarded by information or, you know, and, you know, the most dangerous being misinformation, I think that creates um, tragedy. It creates a lot of problems and it, it, it deters us from moving forward. But used in the right way, technology, living, getting up in the morning, um, you know, whatever the routine is, whatever the lifestyle is, if it, if it comes from a place where it's a giving to, you know, your loved ones, to the community, it's um, nothing should, nothing should stand in the way. Yeah. I fear that that technology is, is making it difficult for conversations like this to be, be something we anticipate as opposed to something that becomes, you know, a rarity. Yeah. I find that we, you know, with technology, you know, people uh, um, could uh, live under an anonymous, you know, page like in Twitter, and then, you know, because of that, be uh, because of that uh, anonymity, there's always this feeling that you could behave as atrocious as possible, and you know, it's 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 exhausting, you know, looking at comments whether or not it's mo you know movies, movie scenes. People are just so anxious to be rude to one another and it's just so unnecessary and it's always living behind that cloud behind that um that um shadow of you know well no one will find out who i am but it still affects it still affects people and the way people communicate is so um is so important i agree now I, we are going to talk about the beethoven but i want to talk about your your composition phoenix which is having a california premiere and i have to admit i scoured the internet trying to find anything i could about this piece and i could find <laughs> nothing there was nothing i could find no reviews you know everything referred back to the album so what can you tell me about this composition so this composition um is um a piano transcription of the first movement of um Kalalu, my um piece for piano and orchestra. And um, I called it Phoenix because, um, you know, similarly to, um, you know, to that movement, it does pay tribute to the past as well as um, 
um, create excitement for the future. And with, with me, with um, my Trinidadian background, I very much wanted to celebrate Calypso w with that work and um, uh, providing a Kalalu of sorts, Kalalu meaning a mixture of various cultures coming together. And um, yeah, that's what Phoenix is all about. Well, good to know. Well, let's talk about the behemoth on your on on this recital, which is, of course, the Beethoven Hammerklavier Sonata in B flat minor. I was able to find out what what Beethoven's Viennese publishers wrote when they when they announced this new sonata in 1819. They called it a work that quote excels above all other creations of this master, not only through its most rich and grand fantasy, but also in regard to artistic perfection and sustained style, and will mark a new period in Beethoven's pianoforte works. Mm -hmm. What sets this sonata apart from all others that Beethoven wrote? And were his publishers right? I think his publishers were absolutely right. I think with every um, uh, sonata that Beethoven wrote, um, they were gems. And um, it's, it's, uh, it was always Beethoven pushing himself to see where he will go. There was never a safety net with any of those works. And um, with the Hammerklavier, I think... Um, until you know, until the last three sonatas, that was the most adventurous uh, work he created, and it uses um, the entire um, keyboard of his piano, and um, um, it pushes the limits between uh, the softest and the loudest. There is um, technical. Um, um, hurdles. There are jumps, and it's almost as if it's it's kind of um, way ahead of its time because you know um, it's 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 definitely a work that could speak to um, the audience of 2022 because there's so much information that happens in such a small period of time. I think every um, five seconds could be a very um, exciting TikTok. And it just, it's, it, it doesn't stop. Even in the um, slow movement, it's, it never rests. It's filled with emotion. It pours out every um, crevice of emotion. And again, no safety net. The last movement is filled with defiance. It's a fugue that puts everything, including the kitchen sink. It goes upside down, it goes backwards. And um, in, a, in an inexhaustible amount of genius for um, every second of that work. So when you're performing a work like that, it's going to require amazing technique. So how do you, how do you blend that technique with getting all that emotion across in a way where it feels like it's cohesive? Because that's I'm a lapsed I'm a lapsed piano performance major, um, and I know that you know there was I had certain teachers who would who wanted technique over everything else and there were other others who wanted emotion and passion over yeah. everything else to do this piece right you have to have both don't you yeah um i could um <laughs> when i um anytime i practice i always think of that um quote from uh, bruce lee in um, enter the dragon where it's emotional content and the ultimate technique is no technique. So you have to have the technique so ingrained. So the last thing you're thinking about is how hard it is. Everything is just about how creative this work is, how emotional that work is, how it moves the public, and just the timing of how Beethoven tells a story. It's, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful arch that happens, you know, from the homage to Baroque, to the slapstick, to this dramatic third movement, to this very eerie um, introduction that goes right into the fugue and um, it's a perfect balance of a lot of, um, of a lot of stuff. Now if if my research is correct, um, you were given two weeks by Leon Fleischer to learn this work when you were when you were first learning it. How has your relationship with it changed and evolved since you first learned it? Oh, it's, it, it was evolving all the time. Um, it, first of all, I was trying to um, uh, 
try to honor the metronome marking. Now, at that time, now um, pianists um, honor the metronome marking, but for the longest time, you know, uh, when we, you know, when I was a student, there was always this idea that Beethoven didn't know what he was doing. It was always played a lot slower, and because it was the Mount Everest of um, of um, sonatas, people always tr treated it like a mountainous opus in every single sense of the word, almost to the point where it got, you know, it, it got it got to the point where it was so heavy. Um, you know, gravitas meant something um, incorrectly, I think, um, you know, during the time when I was learning the piece. And I was always rebelling against that interpretation. And I wanted to crack the mystery behind those metronome markings, but I didn't quite get it yet. I was just going, 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 and I just thought, you know what, there is, this this makes sense. I just need to find my way around it. You know, nothing is impossible. And then, you know, I thought, you know, right, instead of thinking about this as, you know, this mammoth gargantuan opus, why not think of it just merely as another exciting opus, another exciting chapter in Beethoven's life? And I felt like every time Beethoven was writing, he was getting younger and younger and more adventurous. You know, you know, he was never retiring. He was always hungry. So I thought, if I put it in that, you know, that frame, what can I do? And that's how I came up with, all right, you know, the first movement could easily be in that metronome marking, like a homage to Baroque. It could easily be like a Vivaldi concerto where there's a tutti, then there's a solo, then there's a, like a concerto grosso that goes on, there, there's a tutti again. So I thought, well, you know, that's how I'm gonna make this metronome marking work for that movement. For the second movement, I thought, all right, this is, you know, this is comedy. Beethoven absolutely loved comedy and um, like all um, comedic gi giants, there was no um, highbrow or lowbrow, it was all about delivery. So I thought, all right, you know, what, whatever highbrow, lowbrow stuff it is, what makes it funny is timing. So I was studying comedy. I was just looking at all of these incredible dramatic and comedic actors who just were, you know, just had their game on from, you know, Jack Lemmon to Jack Nicholson to, you know, um, all stand-up comics. That, and I was just, you know, studying um, every stand-up on Netflix um, <laughs> during my time off and, you know, cracking... The mystery that way. Third movement is, you know, it's a long work, but it shouldn't feel like a long work. It should feel like it makes you it it just makes you weep. It's it's it has to be. Uh, the performer has to be so in tune with every listener, in order to bring that pain, that vulnerability, that passion across, and it takes. 15 or 16 minutes to bring that whole um, movement to light, but you shouldn't feel the seconds. You should just feel that rhythm. You should feel that dance. You should feel that aria. And then the, the fourth movement, it's just, just, you know, going nuts. But with such control, again, you know, not worrying about the technique, not worrying about how hard it is. It's all about, you know, bringing every voice to light and every time there is that trill how do you make it to a point where um, the audience is going what the heck was beethoven up to well, you know um, this was this was crazy when i was um recording the hammer clap year um a great friend of mine um, was um behind the camera and she she is a a, a film buff as well she adores uh jerry brockheimer movies uh, she was just singing the praises of um the new top gun sequels like you got to see it you didn't see it yet you have to see it so i finally saw it and we're always in touch her um experience with beethoven was very much um the moonlight sonata Lee. so this was very new to her and um her response to the hamaclavier gave me a good lesson too i was like gosh this is the kind of beethoven um i never heard before i don't know if i like this beethoven it's so Unlike anything I heard uh, before, this is definitely not the calm Beethoven I knew. And I thought, well, that's you know that's interesting. Let's 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 peel some layers over there and see how we could bring that crazy Beethoven come to life. But it's crazy, but it's the kind of crazy that we all relate to. We all want to just get out. And I guess that's one thing um, that pandemic was all about. We never wanted to be secluded in that bubble. We all wanted to get out. And you know from TikTok to social media to um, 
strides, you know, with with um, with the um, animosity um, that occurred, there were some strides and people, you know, there was a movement that brought people together and there was this fight for right. And in that vein, I think that's where Beethoven comes from. Even when um, Beethoven is, was, is um, there was a dark cloud. It's never a dark cloud that's gloomy. There's an anger, but it's an anger. It's like, come on, we can do better. Why are we not doing better? It's always this light at the end of the tunnel that Beethoven is trying to fight towards, to get to. Well, given how how beautifully you just laid out, you know, the various movements of, of this sonata, I guess it's only apropos that I ask you about something you told the Toronto Globe and Mail 12 years ago, which is if people start to call me a Beethoven specialist, I would be the happiest man in the world. Do you think you've do you think you personally have achieved that place where you are a Beethoven specialist? I don't know. All I could tell you that every time I play Beethoven, it's 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 to the point where Beethoven possesses me fully that I'm out of my body. It's always an out-of-body experience. I just performed um, the Appassionata um, in San Diego not so long ago, and it was almost, and it, it, it's, it always happens. You know, no matter how many times I perform that piece, the safety net, the safety net is gone, and uh, it's an all-out, uh, no-holds-barred, um, you know, once-in-a-lifetime, do-or-die kind of a thing. It, it it gets it gets crazy <laughs> all the time so that's the only way that i could answer that question um if people are moved by my beethoven that makes me the happiest guy in the world i think that's how i would you know probably um uh correct my statement from 12 years ago if people are moved by my journey to beethoven and if they're um excited to um travel with me that makes me a very happy guy and I assume your your personal journey with Beethoven and, and his music is ever evolving and will never end, right? Never end. Yeah, nor should it, frankly, right? Right. Um, well, let me ask you in conclusion to our interview about something that Beethoven said. Don't only practice your art, but force your way into its secrets. Now, you have the world premiere of your piano concerto. You have the RCM premiere in January. What are the secrets of your art that might be found in your compositions that you hope will continue to be discovered long after you're gone? Uh, I'll put it this way. People, there's always an idea of streaming against the mainstream. And from there, you find your own identity, you find your own truth, you find your own um, individuality. And that's always something that, um, consciously or unconsciously was, you know, something that was always a part of my uh, makeup. And I think in every piece that always comes across. And um, I hope I bring that to every piece um, I write because that's me.